Hi, my name is Katie Halper. I'm the host of the Katie Halper Show, and I'm reporting from the People Summit for the Real News Network. And actually, in an interesting role reversal, I'm going to be interviewing Paul Jay, the founder and CEO of the Real News Network. Paul, thanks for joining us. Oh. How are you? Good. I'm, I, I see. I'm even smiling. I'm accused of never smiling when I'm hosting. So when I'm exactly guesting, I guess maybe I can smile. You're gonna, they're going to tell you to stop smiling so uh, much, yeah, probably. probably yeah. So tell us, speaking of hosting, guesting, what is the thing that you usually host, uh, the Real News Network? What is that for, for your viewers who don't know about it? Um, what I host? Uh, well, your what you host, but also what you what you founded and created. Tell us about what the Real News Network is. Um, it's first of all the economic model is no government funding no advertising no corporate money um, the idea is to follow facts where they lead to be uncompromising about that but i think what's actually unique about what we do is our starting point for how we look at stories uh, strangely enough i know it's a very odd notion but we actually think this is a class society and I know, I know it's... it's a, you guys it's start every, it's, every day it's, reading it's, Capital? No, but we know it's a class society, and it's, it's an outrageous proposition, I guess, because in American discourse, you can have a middle class, but there's no upper or lower. In fact, oh, I think Bernie Sanders is maybe the first one to actually talk about an oligarchy and a billionaire class. But for us, that's how we look at things day to day. We, we don't think we're all in the same boat. We don't think red state, blue state, we're all the United States. We don't think any of that. So if we look at even this issue of the Russians uh, and, and interference in the elections and you know attacking our democracy and so on, we ask the question, well, who's this democracy for in the first place? And it's rather clear this is democracy essentially for the elites. And the, in fact, why are the American elites so concerned about Russian interference in the election? Well, it's because only Americans are allowed to rig American elections. You can't right. have Russians do it. I mean, this that's is our, our lane, right? Ru that's our lane. That's our thing. Yeah, that's I mean, part of our national heritage. Is, rigging elections is, is as American as apple pie. And you Russians, you stay out of our exactly. our Exactly. Right, yeah. right, right. Right. It, they're cramping our style. Cramping right? our style. Um, so, 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 so we start off, one, we, we ask these kinds of questions when we do stories like for whom and, you know, national security. Well, for whom, you know, there's a national security, a foreign policy, you know, that serves a section of the elites and in military industrial complex and so on. There's another section of the elites, the fossil fuel industry, which is mostly driving the Trump administration foreign policy. Uh, so the other part of it is the audience we want are ordinary people. Uh, we want to talk to the majority of people, particularly working people. And, I, and I'd say the other thing that's important about the way we try to cover things is that it's not just about to expose what's wrong. Uh, you know, our headquarters is in Baltimore, and we don't need to persuade anybody that mm, this right. place, that things are screwed up. Uh, what people do need, they need to understand the dynamic of why things are screwed up. Like, for example, it's not some accident there's chronic poverty in Baltimore. It's, it's a result of very specific public policies, public-private partnerships that put tons of pub public money into the Inner Harbor development that was supposed to create jobs and alleviate poverty, except it made a lot of developers rich and poverty got worse. But we also, as part of our reporting, want to look at what the real solutions look like. And so a big part of what we're moving on, whether it's international, national, or Baltimore, whatever we're talking about, well, what policy would be in the interest of, of, of most people? And, and so there's a, a, a sort of a constructive vision, which is why we were interested in the People's Summit, because some of those ideas are emerging in, in these campaigns. So what were some of the most exciting things that you captured while you were here? Either interviews, things that you observed, conversations that you engaged in? Well, I, I think. One of the most interesting was the number of people running for office. Yeah. Uh, and all kinds of people kind of taking up this call that, that Sanders gave in last year's summit had something to do with pushing. Uh, but a lot of local organizing uh, people running at, at all kinds of levels, anywhere from city councils right up to Congress, and some with some success. Uh, uh, primarying uh, some of the right, corporate right-wing Democrats within the party structure as well. Uh, there's places where, uh, you know, pro there's been sort of progressive breakthroughs uh, in terms of a chairmanship of Democratic Party in a certain s district or state. Uh, 
I think that's that's very interesting, and, and the big, uh, increasing notion of how to combine movement building with a political strategy, an electoral strategy, that's interesting. One of the things that bothered me about the summit um, is is I felt there was a little lack of urgency mm. about some of the things. Uh, it, mm. Yes, you need a positive vision to fight for. Yes, you need to build enthusiasm and confidence and so on. But we're not in normal times. Um, the, obviously, with climate change, uh, we have a very, very short window to, to not be into apocalyptic, uh, right. catastrophic times. Uh, uh, the uh, study that came out about six, seven months ago from uh, Richard Watson and seven scientists from the IPCC said that, that if every country that signed the Paris Accords fulfilled the pledge completely, we would still cross the two degree uh, threshold by 2050. And that was before Trump was elected. So redo the model now that there's going to be no US participation at all. And it's probably going to mean hardly anybody else is going to do the Paris Accords because they're going to say, well, if Americans aren't doing it, why us? So we could be seeing a two degree threshold cross by 2040, 2035. I mean, I don't know. but. It's, it's within our lifetimes, within our kids' lifetimes, we're getting into very serious times. Uh, we talked about, I shouldn't say we, right. the summit talked about climate change. It was on the agenda, which was good. But not, to me, the sense of urgency. And, and then the other thing that was really missing here, and, and I, I've raised that, I uh, interviewed one of the, Michael Lighty about it, and, and you know, they, they said they would talk more about it next year, but the whole issue of foreign policy. What foreign policy? Yeah. Exactly. Right. Well, you know, the, Trump is planning war. It's clear. Right. He's working with the Saudis. They're going to they're going to they're gonna upgrade U.S. troop levels in uh, in Iraq. Uh, they, he's, he joked at the CIA when he went there after his inaugural address that we should have seized the oil the first time. Well, right. we're, we're going to have a second chance at it. Um, he already did stuff in Syria. Yeah, the, the, uh, it's very, very dangerous times, and this attack on Qatar, the dip, dip, diplomatic attack, seems to be because Qatar wouldn't go along with the uh, big anti-Iran strategy, so now they're even talking about regime change in Qatar, which is kind of a crazy notion. I, th I think there should have been an intersection in this, because what's driving all this is fossil fuel politics. Mm -hmm. They want to get at Iraqi light crude, which is perhaps the, the biggest source of available, drilled for, light crude in the world, sitting in Iraq. And they don't like that the Iraqi government is probably more pro-Iranian than it is pro-American, and that a lot of the oil concessions that did go, didn't go to American oil companies, they went to China and some others. And uh, so, so this intersection between climate change issues, an, an administration being driven by the fossil fuel companies, Tons of money being thrown at the Pentagon to say, you know, you, you know, you'll get 54 billion dollars and you'll play ball with us in Iraq when we want to go get the oil. I think it should have been a presence at the conference, and I think there should have been a sense of urgency about this issue of anti-war as an integrated thread mm. in the rest of what's being talked about. Uh, but on the whole, I thought it was. It's pretty good to have this many people with a vision, especially a vision, very willing to attack the corporate Democrats, right. which, which you, I don't think is any serious change without defeating them or at least exposing them. And mocking them. Mocking them is, mocking is, good. Mocking is good. I would have liked to have seen a workshop dedicated to reading uh, the passage from Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Village. I don't know if you heard about this. They recently discovered this passage. This is a book from the 90s, but someone on Twitter found it. And it's a passage in which Hillary Clinton describes how it was a long-standing tradition in the uh, Arkansas governor's mansion to use prison labor. And she felt uh, apprehensive about it. I'm not making this up. This is totally true. She was apprehensive about it, but it was a long-standing tradition. And you know, there, it's a bit of a problematic thing when that's your excuse for doing something, especially in the South. But it, there's a long-standing tradition of prison labor that's employed by the first by the governor and the first lady and it lowers costs 
and um, as it's exploitation good to is, be efficient, yeah, exactly yeah. as it's as it is its want. Um, and she felt apprehensive about it. So at, at first I thought that meant that she was apprehensive about using this because it's problematic. But no, she was apprehensive about having criminals in her kitchen in the morning. She, she said that. She said it's one thing to be representing these people in court. It's another thing to be seeing them in the kitchen. But um, if, they, if they violated any, any of the rules, they were disciplined. I'm not making this up. It's all there. And um, so I thought it'd be good to have a dramatic reading of it or just like playing the audio. Because she's sort of like, sort of like the Howard Zinn th People speak, people speak exactly. Except Hillary, this would be Hillary speaks. speaks, exactly. Yeah. That should have been like the epilogue, right? <laughs> the, the 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 past is prologue. The 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 90s past is, is epilogue, um, but that was it was kind of amazing. And the and the best thing about it was seeing the neoliberals uh, who like to call everything that Sanders does misogynist and racist and homophobic. It was interesting to see their creative ways of responding to it. Um, they actually tried to pretend on that. Um, the people objecting to this use of prison labor, we were okay with prison labor. It, it, it just was that we were, we were using it to criticize Hillary. So the narrative is that before this happened, we didn't care about that. We were all pro-prison labor. Then we found out Hillary used it, and now we're against it. Yeah, these, the, the elites everywhere. Yes. It's not unique about the American elites, but you've got to dehumanize those who you exploit. And the more you sure. want to exploit them, the more you've got to dehumanize them. But what's weird about what we're seeing now is this total, I think, hijacking of identity politics where the people who claim to speak for or care about disenfranchised groups are the ones who then turn around and actually, it's so sinister. It's kind of like the Twilight Zone. Um, it's like a futuristic Twilight Zone, uh, I don't know, a hand, Handmaid's Tale something, where they actually pretend that they are protecting uh, disenfranchised people, they are speaking out against misogyny by defending Hillary Clinton's use of prison labor. Well, I, I thought also a similar note was when Hillary kind of said that it was unfortunate how many people had suffered because of Bill Clinton's uh, crime bill. The one she stumped that, for. Yeah, the, uh, the one she stumped for. The fact that they introduced a system of mass incarceration. Right. It's unfortunate that some people suffered from that. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah it, people are not. Uh, I, I had a chance to uh, get to know Gore Vidal pretty well before oh, nice. he died. I interviewed him a bunch of times, and you know, he said he said you have to understand about the American elites is that they are completely, utterly amoral, on every level, whether it's mm -hmm. their personal life, or right. their the way they look at the world, and and then number two. Um, people who are not in the elites, it's only a level of various degrees of how human people are, but they're all subhuman. So, you know, if you're a white worker, you're a subhuman as a white worker, but then if you're a colored white worker, if you're a black white worker, if you're a woman, there's all these degrees, but everybody outside the elites right. are not really fully human. Right, but it's a divide and conquer technique that works so well, right? Um, which I think that Clinton, I think that actually that's what a lot of people do with this trying to pit, you know, this idea that, that someone like Sanders is somehow throwing people of color and women under the bus by offering single payer. I don't know if there's this total pitting together of, of groups as if they have different interests. And obviously I'm not oversimplifying it, like different populations and groups have different histories and circumstances. But it's not like single payer hurts some people and helps other people. I mean, it helps everyone. It helps the 99%. Yeah, I don't get, even get the argument. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, this is a weird thing that you hear um, from, again, from neoliberals, from people who, who only, uh, who pretend that everything on the left is a, is like a privilege, a single white male, uh, a white male privilege. I don't know if you've heard this. I, we'll have to do a whole, I'm gonna have to do like a, yeah. a webinar on this, but it's this thing that- Workshop on Yeah, it. workshop on it. I need a it. workshop on this. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really comedic, but I mean, this is stuff that like, people like Joan Walsh talk about all the time, right? And it's on Twitter, and I know Twitter's not the real world, but Twitter is a window into where the soul of the media would be if they had a soul, and it's true. So you see these people literally arguing that things like um, single payer or the minimum wage are, are are privileges and radical, and uh, straight white men are the only people who have the luxury of caring about that stuff. I know it's 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 I, be, I believe that the technical political science term for it is Michigas. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they're giving me the wrapping it up sign because that's what happens when you start using Yiddish. 
<laughs> people get uncomfortable. <laughs> so thank you so much, Paul J, for speaking to me. Paul J of the Real News Network. I'm thank Katie you. Helper of the Katie Helper Show.